Josh, everyone always loves to talk about reserve assets and assets in general. Important topics need to be given weight and thought. But I think the real question from all of this is, what is going to be the... Three, three two, one. But I think the real issue here, and maybe the better question is, what is going to be the reserve liability? Here's what I mean by this. As you like to follow economics, there are multiple schools that will will kind of make war on each other. A good example of this would be, let's say, Austrians and the Keynesians. Austrians would argue for a full reserve or something very similar, a banking system. In other words, you cannot fractionally reserve assets. Well, the Keynesians, on the other hand, might go to the completely opposite extreme and say, listen, you don't need to have any reserves whatsoever. And generally, these two sides can really go after each other. And what I find interesting, Josh, is I think that they both make actually very good points. And I think they're, they're both right and they're both wrong. Here's what I mean by this. If you think back to George Gammon and Jeff Booth's recent debate, Gammon raised the point that, listen, in the future, whatever the reserve asset becomes, people are still going to want to borrow in it. And for legitimate reasons, not for speculation or shenanigans, to start businesses, buy homes, buy cars, whatever, you name it. The problem is, is that if you're borrowing against, or you're, if you're borrowing value in an asset that is incredibly hard, you, the borrower, run the risk of having that asset appreciate, meaning that when you have to pay back that asset, you're actually going to have to pay back more in real terms. On the other side of the equation, you have something similar to what's going on today, where you can borrow in something that can depreciate or that can be inflated away, at least if you're in America, borrowing in U.S. dollars. The rest of the world borrowing in Euro dollars, that's a separate problem, but we'll get to that in a second. So the point is, is that in the former situation, the lender is protected because chances of inflation, not very high. In the latter situation, like what we have today, the borrower is essentially protected because with inflation ramping up, well, they still have to pay back their loan, but they're paying back the loan in dollars with dollars that are worth less than what they borrowed it on. And I think really the answer here comes from a mediation between the two sides. In other words, both have excellent points, and I think the points that they raise right now will also be applicable into whatever the new financial system is that we will go into sooner or later. So, Josh, going back to the title of the video, everyone rightfully rightfully talks about reserve assets, an important question. But I think really the way to frame it is not so much what is the world reserve asset going to be, but rather what is the world reserve liability going to be? Because if, three, two, one, here's why. The current system we have set up, the assets that we use, it's actually a liability. It's not necessarily an asset in and of itself. And this is the euro dollars that are loaned into existence by other euro dollar banks making loans to other euro dollar banks for all intents and purposes. And so I think if you frame it as what's the world's, world's reserve liability, it's a much clearer way to think about it than in terms of the world reserve asset. And the second thing is that if you frame it as a liability, you also open up the door to having multiple assets underpin and create value to support the liability, whatever it is, or whatever the world reserve liability is going to be uh, for that. Well, so let me kind of the, unpack that. The world reserve li oh, yeah. What is the world reserve liability right now? I would argue the current unit that denominates the world reserve liability is a dollar. But as you and I have talked about before, Ed, and many other people who are smarter than us have talked, at, talked about extensively, a dollar is not a dollar is not a dollar in terms of how it's created, who created it, or what can be created in terms of a dollar. So the short answer to your question is I would argue the world's reserve liability is a euro dollar, which carries the denomination and the unit, like the it's the unit of account of a dollar. But then it gets really weird because you have to start asking the question, well, who can create a dollar or who can create a synthetic IU dollar and so on and so forth. And how you do distinguish between these um, various unit or essentially how do you see the counterparty through whatever transaction that's claiming we've issued a unit of a dollar. All right, so what does it look like in the future? One of the more interesting ideas I've seen suggested for whatever the new financial system is going to look like going forward is a combination where you have the asset side of the balance sheet. And when I say balance sheet, I kind of mean like the balance sheet of humanity in total. And I, I can expand on that if you want me to. But let's just say that you can have multiple things sitting on the left-hand side, the debit side of the balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet, whether you want Bitcoin, whether you want physical gold, silver, perhaps you have various commodities, um, you're a, you're a miner or an oil producer, perhaps you're a real estate guy, you make jet engines, whatever. 
you can have various things that you want to say, like, listen, this is what we're going to have on the left-hand side. And it might be unique depending upon the person. It might be unique depending upon the country, the state, the region, the company, the line of business they're engaged in, whatever. The left-hand side of the balance sheet where you would have the assets is kind of where you can explore the creativity of something that you think will have value. And that's where I would start on this. And I think this also is very true to what you're seeing right now. And it's also my argument of what brings the Austrians kind of back into the equation where it's like, listen, if you want to use a full reserve asset or if, or if you want to use as your asset base and only do business with people who, 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 who feel the same way, something that's full reserve, you can do so. You know, if you only want to you know, say, you know, do business with banks that are full reserve Bitcoin or some other digital asset that's full reserve, great, you know, go for it and do that. But at the same time, you can also pick and choose on that front. So I think that's a really important thing. But I think the real secret in all of this is focusing not so much on the asset side, but on the liability side. And this is where I would, I'm becoming more and more persuaded by this argument that you actually want to standardize the ledger, but only the ledger on the liability side, not on the asset side. Josh, whether we're talking about GameStop, whether you're talking about COMEX, Metal, Shenanigans, whether you're talking about Final Settlement, just, just name anything that you want to go into. Assets are very, very easy to prove. And that's one of the reasons, or excuse me, easy to prove. <laughs> Assets are much easier to prove, I would argue, than the liability side of the equation. For example, if you say, listen, I self-custody you know, 1,000 Bitcoin, here's the wallet address or addresses where you can verify by yourself, bam, you can see that. If you want to say, I self-custody or I have at my custodian three tons of gold, you know, here are the serial numbers of the bars, send an auditor to review it, bam, you can do it. And this is one of those reasons I would say that the asset side of the balance sheet can be uh, decentralized. You can kind of bring whatever you want to that party because it's much easier for the individual to go through or an individual or a um, group of individuals to prove this in a way that would be authoritative in terms of that. But the liability side is where you run into issues. And that's kind of, I think, where we're at right now because proving liabilities is much, much trickier and it's much more nuanced. And I think the way that you're able to thread that particular needle is you standardize the ledger, which is just a fancy way of saying, if any firm, if any company, if any individual, whatever, right? Let's say does business with America or does business with anyone who wants to do business with America. If they're going to issue M2 of whatever, whether it's an IOU dollar, an IOU euro, an IOU barrel of oil, an IOU frequent flyer point, it doesn't matter. But if you're going to issue a derivative in, in M2 blank, you know, whatever that is, you have to report it and you have to do it in a way where it's transparent and everyone can see the exposure of this M2 that you've issued. You with me? Okay, because what's going on right now is when you look at the euro dollar system, I think probably the biggest problem is is that nobody, I should say nobody, um, the majority of players I don't think can readily verify the liabilities of other players. And while there certainly might be some shenanigans going on behind the scenes, I don't necessarily, I mean, you don't have to have bad actors and shenanigans for this to happen. You can just have the evolution of a very old system that's been tortured since the 70s to stay relevant because we didn't have anything better to replace well, it yeah, with. It's, it's not even just the bad actors. You don't know it's on your own balance sheet because yeah. uh, let's, let's just say you're a JP Morgan or just any bank and me and Justin are both on the trading firm and I am transacting with a Japanese bank. Justin is also transacting with that same Japanese bank. Nobody is watching over our shoulder and writing down every single uh, interest rate swap that we are doing because those things are literally, they are quite literally in the footnotes of the balance sheet report. Uh, and nobody knows it. Those, me and Justin are not saying, hey, hey, dude, guess what trade I just put on? I could put on the opposite trade as him undoing exactly what he just did for the portfolio, Justin are not uh, communicating, saying what we're doing. Nobody in the bank is. So you don't know what anybody is doing in your own firm. How the hell would you know what XYZ bank is doing with their firm? There's absolutely no way because there's no transparency within the liability side of the balance sheet. Yeah. And Josh, kind of your point, let's just assume everyone's trying to act as a rational actor in their own interest. Now, don't get me wrong. They're trying to make money and, and search out profit, but they're not necessarily trying to shenanigans. They're not trying to spoof or anything like that. If you have this data that is incredibly relevant, because you could argue, and I would think this, I would emphatically argue this, that if you want to understand the financial picture of a firm, yes, assets are important, a very important piece of the equation. But if let's say some major crypto exchange comes out and says like, listen, we've got 
a hundred thousand Bitcoin in cold storage or whatever, right? Okay. Well, great. So the real question then is you've got a hundred thousand Bitcoin that you have that let's just say you prove that you own. What are the claims on these Bitcoins that have been issued? Because if you, let's say, have customers who think that they're owed 200,000 Bitcoins, well, if all those customers would throw out once, the firm short a hundred thousand. And so this is why I would make the argument that you need to have a centralized ledger that works for any asset or that where a tokenized representation of any asset can be put up in a standardized, transparent, and very quickly to update uh, fashion so that you can answer the question, not only what is the asset side, which, you know, bring whatever you want to the table, but also what are the liabilities that we've issued against those assets? And then based upon that, you're really able to attack the, um, or excuse me, I have to say attack. I can't think of a better way yet to level the asymmetric information advantage that we have right now. I mean, you know, we haven't done a video on it some time, but, you know, going, going back to our favorite uh, stock, you know, <laughs> GME and all that stuff, the big question on that front, and this is one of the things you and I have talked about before, the real question that the GMEs and myself, I would, which I would count myself among this, want to answer is that if you look at all the shares that have been issued, or at least all the shares of the free float, how does this number square with the various shares that retail thinks that they own? So if you were to freeze time, into this moment in time, you freeze time, you take everyone's balance sheet and you aggregate it all together, you say, okay, listen, whether you've got a broker, which of Fidelity, Schwab, Robinhood, whatever you name it, I want to look at all these balance sheets merged into one, and then I want the question to be answered. Once it's merged into one, how many shares of GameStop are owned on this balance sheet on the asset side? Because that will explain the liability side of the brokerage firms where the accounts are held at i don't know what the answer is but i think that's the question that needs to be asked and this i think serves to highlight the importance of the poor tools we have right now to prove liabilities and this gets back to my prior point of the video where assets of course are the sexy side of the balance sheet and i think you can do whatever you want on that side but the liabilities are the important point that, that that's where the power is because liabilities or tokenized representations m2 of whatever that's not going anywhere in fact and i, and I don't think it should go anywhere and if we're going to have to live with this we're going to have to conjure this demon and then live with it and so this is where the austrians i think get a little wrong and the Keynesians start to get it right you do have to have a fractional reserve system, or you, you will have to fractionally reserve assets. It does make sense from time to time, but only if you can report the data and the liabilities that have arisen from this fractional reserving of assets in a way that's clear and transparent, where all market participants, or as many market as many market participants as possible, have access to this data. And of course, the usual, you know, data has to be accurate, it has to be factual, it has to be timely updated, etc. The real question is, have we ever had a system like this in history? I don't think so. And if that's the case, I think you have to question what? Yeah, so I would say we, we've had systems like this before, but never on the scale. Like it goes back, this is maybe a question for Snyder. <clears throat> this is maybe a question for Snyder, but think about when the Euro dollar system first started. <laughs> Think about the euro system, your dollar system when it first started. Maybe there were, let's say, I mean, I, I don't know, Snyder might know the answer to this. Let's say there were 10 banks in the city of London and all 10 bank, you know, the the the, uh, the bank, you know, director or the chief credit officer, or, you know, basically the top 10 execs at each of these banks. Let's say they all went to the same, you know, gentleman's social club. And this is, you know, late 50s, early 60s after work. And so even though they all had their own private ledgers in terms of liabilities, the, the connection was so small and therefore the complexity was, was very much reduced. They all kind of knew each other. They all kind of grew up with each other. They all went to the same schools. And so there was this very informal nexus that actually served as a de facto way where each of them could kind of see into the operations of the other and trust the operations of, the, of each other. Again, like late 50s, early 60s or whatever, right? But when you fast forward that to where we are today and you have a system that's basically just blown up in a good way and i guess in a sense because you know certainly needed but without the various ways to move information and share information between these institutions and what's more if you have incorrect assumptions like value at risk of r would be that that's a separate video but let's just say if you have incorrect assumptions in this that are serving to miscalculate and then obscure risk uh, that, that exists from, you know, banks taking or from any financial institution taking exotic positions and whatever. That's a problem. And so to your point, I would say we probably have had systems before that have allowed for a transparent liability ledger to be shared in a de facto manner, but never something that I'm aware of that's risen to the scale and complexity as to what is currently demanded right now. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I mean, that would be a very interesting world to sneak into and peek. 
to see what it actually looks like on a transactional basis. Because ideally, everybody just transacts in commerce and tries to grow their own business and works in their own best interest. And there are not doofuses on the internet talking about how we need to fix the monetary system. I, I think that'd be yeah. a lot more productive for society as a whole if if nobody knew who Jerome Powell was, if he was just the useless central banker that he actually is. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. we, we, the, our monetary system's gotten so screwed up that there's huge amounts of people who need to try and educate people on what's going on. I'm not saying we're doing that because we know the bare minimum, but I would like to see a financial system 20 years down the road that doesn't need constant monitoring because it actually works the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. Joshua, here's some predictions I'll make. So this, this is what I think, whatever the, the next iteration of it is, here, here's some guesses on that. I think you are going to see a CBDC, but a CBDC is going to be much more along the auspices of a central or of a, let's just instead of calling it a CBDC, what do I like to call it? A CLDL. CLDL. Yeah, CL. So don't think CBDC. CBDCs are coming, but don't think it was a CBDC. Think of it as a CLDL, a Central Liabilities Digital Ledger. And from that, this is going to be centralized. So that's that's the bad news. But ideally, it will be centralized in a decentralized manner. I know I'm not trying to do word games here, but my point is is that you pick some, let's say, digital asset or digital ledger that you know can that can um that all financial institutions are going to issue a derivative, whether it's a bank deposit to an options contract, whatever, they all have to participate, settle through and report on whatever this, you know, shared ledger is. So that is the centralization. I think this is actually something that centrals can do a very good job of in terms of enforcing the regulation and enforcing compliance on that. But just as tightly as you regulate the liabilities side, because that's generally where all the mischief occurs. You also likewise deregulate the asset side of the balance sheet. That is to say, if you want to, you know, transact into the Bitcoin, if you want to transact in gold, whatever, right? You know, you bring whatever assets you want to the table as regulated and as tightly as you keep the right hand side of the credit side of the balance sheet, you know, the, the stuff of the imagination, as tightly as you keep your hand on that, you also let it be as open and free on the left hand side, the debit side of the balance sheet uh, on terms of um, lack of regulation what people want to bring. Or in other words, people are regulating themselves to say, listen, you know, I'm saying I'm bringing, you know, 10 Bitcoin to the table. Why do I say this? Because here's my wallet with the addresses where you can verify right now that I've got the, the, the 10 Bitcoin or, you know, here's the audit list of, you know, gold bars in the vault, you name it. Oh, and lastly, Josh, if I could just say one more thing. And I think this is also a very interesting way where you might see a reconciliation and a mediation between what we call the Austrians and the Keynesians right now, where you have a way for those who wish to transact with only full reserve or who emphatically believe, for good reasons perhaps, why full reserve is important. But you also have a way where the economic necessity and just the reality of the situation in terms of issuing fractional reserve assets, so in other words, you get into M2 of whatever, you, you also have that reconciled back with, so in other words, the Keynesians reconciled back with the Austrians. Yeah. On final thoughts, Justin, I'm growing up the beard like you right now. It's Oh, good <laughs> luck with that. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. probably the longest it's ever been. I, I see that you're starting to get some gray hairs up on the chin. You like to think that would make it means that I'm smarter, but not quite yet. So no, just older. Just older, no longer Just older, uh, uglier, slower. <laughs> <laughs> you're no longer 2027 20, or uh, no, 20, 2017, 2018, whatever. Yeah, I, haven't, I, I haven't hit 2020 yet, but it's just around the corner, I suppose. <laughs> so, not spring uh, chickens anymore. Nope. I mean, soon enough, I'll be getting hair transparents and uh, transplants. Well, yeah. What, what, whatever else old men do when they start to lose their hair but that day is not today so thank god for that and thank god that we have a future cldl coming maybe in 500 years maybe in five i don't know justin i'll see you on your next take care man bye